I am Bill Courtright with Living Right with Bill Courtright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Courtright. And I am here with the super millennial, David Barreto. How are you doing, super millennial? I'm doing good. Why are you whispering? Is this a secret? You just have to get closer. You got to talk into the damn mic, son. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Huh? How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Productive day. Another one? Always. Try. So, so any announcements? Um. Yes. So... This upcoming Monday, we will obviously put some information out this weekend for it. But the links and the website to get the Immune Shield is up. Excellent. It's approved. It's ready. We already have order shipping out for those who are in the community. I saw a few of you guys take advantage of it. We will be letting it out to the public for everybody to get. And like I said, order's already coming in. Yeah, we got a really good deal on it. We're, we're basically just making making sure we cover our costs. Yeah. And so, because we want to get it out. So, next week on the show, uh, the topic's going to be a COVID-19 reset. We'll I didn't even know that. Thing that so. kind of works at a good timing, huh? Board's right up there. Uh, so <laughs> look at it the day before I need to, man. So we're going to, we're going to talk about this next, next week. I'm going to start talking about, because as things are going to start to, um, loosen up, mm -hmm. I want people to be ready to go for their health, for their mindset, for even their spirituality. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So this week, our topic was acceptance and we opened up Monday. Did you show the post? Did you ever get the post in there? You know, I never went back and looked. I probably should. Yes, you should. So Mondays with the Super Millennial was acceptance and well-being. On health huddles this week, we talked on. No, we did not do that. That was not you. What was your show? I'm sorry. Uh, accepting things we can't change. Accepting things we can't change. Health huddles was acceptance and well-being. And meeting of the minds, we talked on growth versus a fixed mindset. And yesterday, we had... Mr. Mark Middleston on, and we talked to, that was a good, uh, people like that, right? We talked a little bit about expansion, and it's going to go into today's book as we are looking at Mark's chapter number 14 in Alchemy of Purpose, Mark Middleston's book, and it's going to kind of tie from yesterday's interview till now. So I see, are you done playing with the damn mic so we can go to work? Hey, you know, I know the mic is quiet when you show up quiet. Is that too quiet? Just a little bit. You think it's too loud now? No, no, no. Let's just go to work. Just don't yell, please. So, chapter 14 is the astronomical perspective. If we are ever going to imagine with limitless possibilities, we have to remove the limitation of our thoughts. I'm talking about a major shift in our thinking so that we understand not only our place within our family, society, or even the global community, but our place in the entire universe. I'm talking about cultivating an astronomical perspective. Most people seldom think about outer space. In fact, outside their favorite science fiction show, they probably don't give it any contemplation at all. A relative few are aware that our planet is spinning like a top at nearly 1,000 miles per hour. Just think about it. Right now, at this very moment, we are traveling around the sun at the speed of around 67,000 miles per hour. Of course, we can't feel ourselves moving, and so, like so many things in life, this space flight is simply taken for granted. We tend to think our planet as the center of the universe, a snow globe with pretty stars painted on the outer shell. Everything else is out there. Even our closest um, <laughs> celestial neighbor, the moon, is still almost a quarter million miles away and only shows up at certain times throughout the month. So we take it for granted as well, despite the fact that it pulls all our oceans along with it and also affects our bodies. There is one thing I'll tell you, the moon does affect your body, right? We can't talk about that though. But again, you're a werewolf, aren't you? Not ready for that okay, conversation. Not right. <laughs> but again, why consider it when it doesn't seem to affect our daily life. We are too busy to notice or care. All those pretty stars we see at night, if we notice them at all, 
are just like our sun. Yet, some are so enormous, they make it seem like a head of a pin. There are billions of them out there beyond our solar system. Yet, some of those stars are entire galaxies, far beyond our own Milky Way, containing billions of their own stars and planets. All of these stars and galaxies out in the universe are dancing around each other at overwhelming distances and speed. Our solar system is racing around the core of the Milky Way at over a half a million miles per hour, yet we cannot comprehend it. As fast as we are moving, it requires one quarter billion years to circumnavigate it, and yet we are unaware, trapped in our ignorance of our own choosing. One of the billions of galaxies beyond our own, the closest is the Andromeda, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Mark, galaxy, probably not. <laughs> probably not. We can actually see it with an unaided eye, though without a telescope, we just see its bright core, mistaking it for a dim, fuzzy star. The Andromeda Meta, is 2.5 million light years away and has a radius of 110,000 light years. A light year, the distance light travels in one Earth year is roughly 6 trillion times, which means the Andromeda is 2.5 million times 6 trillion miles away, yet we can still see it because it is over 200,000 light years in diameter. Even with an expanded perspective, it is difficult to grasp the enormity of scale and proportion of the universe. Anything you want to say about that? I love space. <laughs> you, I love it because I don't understand it. Of course you do. <laughs> so here is something even more mind-blowing. If you've ever had the opportunity to see the Andromeda through the telescope under a dark sky, you know that you can see its spiral, arm, its spiral arms made of dust and billions of other stars of its own. As impressive a sight as it is, what really is amazing is that you are seeing what it looked like 2.5 million years ago. Now, how is that? Why? Because that's how long it took for its light to reach our eyes. Comprehend that? Yeah. I told you I love this chapter. It's, it's good. Chapter. You are literally looking back in time. We won't see how it looks now for another 2.5 million years. Not that we'll be alive to see it, of course. This is but one galaxy of such immense proportions and distances and distant out of billions. In 1995, the Hubble Space Telescope took the world's most famous photo of our universe. The astronomers pointed the Hubble at a region just above the Big Dipper that was no larger than a pinhead held at arm's length. The computer analysis of the photo revealed over 15,000 distinct galaxies in that singular speck of the sky, some of which were among the very first galaxies in existence when our universe was just first formed. Just take a moment to imagine this universe that we are currently aware of. What kind of imagination is required to grasp the immensity of the universe and our place in it? Of all the things one can find out in the universe, none are more relevant or symbolic to our purpose as the nebulae. These giant clouds of gas are pure energy condensing under the pressure of gravity to create new stars, bursting with the light force that created everything, including us. Of the billions of nebulae, nebula, nebula uh. there, you sure? Mm -hmm. There is one that's easily visible to the naked eye, the Great Orion Nebula. Many have seen the winter constellation of the Orion, the Hunter. Even the most novice of observers have seen the familiar belt of three bright stars, all in neat straight lines. What many do not realize is that just a bit below the left of these three bright stars lies two dim, fuzzy stars. The faintest of the two is not a star at all, but the great Orion Nebula itself. It lies 1,344 light years, 
That's 1,344 times 6 trillion miles away from the Earth, yet we can see it because it's 40 light years in diameter or 240 trillion miles wide. Four of the brightest stars called the trapezium, I only know that from the trap muscle, <laughs> within the heart of this nebula are considered very young, meaning they're only about a million years old. The significance of this and other nebulae is not the enormity of them or their distance from us, but what they are and what they represent. Nebulae are often referred to as stellar nurseries or star factories. To view a nebula is to witness the consciousness of the universe at work. One could then, from a different perspective, say they are seeing God at work, as if all of life is an evidence enough. Even an atheist cannot deny the energy of the universe is at work here, through, though they don't attribute it to the same source. The same energy we are creating these stars lives within us. We are one with everything in the universe. Understanding that this energy lives within us and gives us life is empowering. If this energy can take clouds of gas and turn them into stars, surely we can do something less majestic and manipulate it into the life we desire. It is, our only, it is only in our limited thoughts and beliefs that we have no power to do so, despite the abundant evidence to the contrary that the universe provides to us. We don't need a telescope to see the evidence. In fact, one need look no further than their own sun. It radiates this energy on, out into our solar system, giving the sustaining life on Earth. To see the sun under the total solar eclipse is, is to glimpse this energy radiating out from it, shimmering out in the rays of its cornea, out into the dark sky among other stars and planets in plain view in the middle of the day. When one views this rare sight of totality from the perspective of oneness, it can be a life-transforming event, causing a major shift in how we see ourselves in the world, a world around us in a profound way. Imagine being Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon. As he looked back at Earth and the rest of humanity, imagine how such an experience would go right to the core of your being after your awareness of life. Edwin, uh, Edwin Aldrin, the second man on the moon, said upon his return that the experience changed his life forever. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut aboard Apollo 14 and the sixth man to walk on the surface of the moon, said that on his way back to Earth, he had a powerful Safakalpa Samadhi experience where the body is in a trance-like state, but consciousness is fully perspective of its blissful experience within, which prompted him to create the Institute of Noetic Sciences for the purpose of consciousness research. These men didn't need to use their imagination as their first-hand experience led directly to an incredible shift in their perspective. Yet, we can see our imagination and wonder and how it might change us as well. If you're wondering, what an eighth grade science lesson has to do with personal growth or finding our purpose, consider this. Due to our tribal programming, most people never move past the eighth grade perspective. They continue to live their life and this limited awareness and imagination, especially those dwelling on the material level. Of those who do increase their awareness, most still view everything from a limited earth realm perspective. They see Earth as the center of the random universe and themselves as individuals struggling to get by. But if we can truly grasp our place in the universe and understand the energy within as the consciousness of it, our perspective can shift dramatically towards our higher purpose in life. Super thoughts. That's the end of that chapter. I love it, man. The, the first time I really got like interested into space and stuff like that is when I found out that they're going into something they actually have no idea. 
And I thought that was such like a, a weird perspective. Like they're going up there. They really don't. We don't know much about space, mm-hmm. you know, and they're going up there. You know how <laughs> scary it is to think about it from down here. I saw I the first, that, like, I saw the first moon landing, right? The first time, you know, and I was, I might like, eight years old. Yeah, yeah I mean, amazing. we, we live forget. right here, so we get to see all of them go yes. up and stuff. And, and that for me was like, I, yeah. I always think about this, man. The fact that we don't know much. Yep. It's, it's crazy. We don't know anything. Yeah, like. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the interview yesterday, Mark and I, we, had, we agree on it. We don't know anything. And if you really, what he's trying, why this chapter touched me was. Think about the expansion that we have and we just kind of lock ourselves in our own little human constraint and we put ourselves in our own little cage and there's so much that we can do because there's so much universe out there Mm -hmm. and it's huge when you think about when he's rifling off those numbers and thinking about you're seeing this won't see that again for two million years you know. I think, I think that's what does a big thing, like the way that you view, you know, this, like you said, it's such an eighth grade yes. teaching, but it's so big because like if well, you what, look at this with that fear versus What he was saying there is that most people never get past that eighth mm-hmm. grade, right? So imagine yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's right because mm-hmm. that's about right when you look at the, that's usually, that's about when that's they, the they go into, yeah. because they go into socialized mm-hmm. mind because that is when that child is coming out of stage two and going into stage three and he's right that's it mm-hmm. that's you ain't worried about the unknown you're worried about what's in front of you yes so i want to go into chapter 15 i got time so the significance in the insignificant this is a good chapter too so in the last chapter we attempted to shift our perspective by exploring the vastness of the universe essentially we discovered that we live in a very tiny ball of a ro- of rock racing around a tiny star within a galaxy among billions of other stars with our own planets among billions of other galaxies in the universe. Makes us seem pretty insignificant, right? And this leads me to another critical point and another opportunity to shift our thinking. Just as we often fail to see the big picture, we also take the little things in life for granted when in truth they can potentially bring great meaning to our life. I want to share with you a story from my own life that led to a drastic shift in my perspective. In the 1990s, I was a successful artist and I conducted art workshops to teach others about my tools and techniques. As successful as I was, at that point in my life and career, I was going through the motions, running my default programs, much as we all do. On one ordinary morning, I was driving to a conference center, a conference center for another workshop. This particular day was extremely windy. And as I drove along, the trees captured my attention with branches being blown about, twisting and bending to the will of the wind. Large groupings of trees were all swaying in the concert with each other. I noticed how the color of the leaves changed as they moved from about revealing the lighter undersides one moment and a darker green of their tops the next. The trees were not just moving, they were shifting in patterns and color. It was then that a flock of crows caught my eye. They too were being blown about by the wind. I thought how difficult it must be for them to fly in this weather until I realized that they were not struggling, but playing in it. They swooped down in large arcs and then rose again as if on a roller coaster made of air performing acrobatics with all the skill of a fighter pilot flying in tandem. My gaze shifted to the clouds beyond them, moving rapidly across the blue morning sky, shape-shifting in a myriad of colors, reflecting the morning sun behind me. I realized I was looking at everyday things in an entirely new way a new awareness was developed within me. Why did I suddenly begin seeing these things this way? Certainly I had seen trees, birds, and clouds blowing in the wind before, as we all have. What was so significant about today that was different from any other windy day? My awareness and this new awareness, I then mindfully looked at everything within my field of view this way. The grasses along the road were also dancing in the wind, with vast areas all around creating such interesting and ever-changing patterns. I noticed the gravel of the shoulder in such amazing detail 
the pebbly pavement of the road and everything else within my senses were experienced in a deeper way. The ordinary thing I always say were now being experienced in extraordinary. So if I had never before seen all these things now being revealed to me with such clarity, what else had I been missing? I suddenly had an ep epiphany. The world around me didn't change. I did. I was filled with such excitement over the discovery of my awareness. Before that day, I might have been this observant of the birds or trees if they were the subject of a painting, but not in my physical reality. You're writing hard, dude. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're writing hard. I began, he's doing his art. Just so you know, Mark, David's doing his art. <laughs> Don't stop. You look like you look like you're paralyzed. It's okay. Go ahead. Right. Draw. You. Just go draw. So <laughs> Mark continues. I began contemplating the meaning behind this. Moment by moment, day after day, I had begun I had been taking most everything in my life for granted. I was living in ego, but no longer. I realized that the most important tool an artist has is a keen observation of the world around us. After that fateful drive. I not only became more observant, I found deeper meaning in everything I observed. As with my other workshops, I had created a syllabus of sorts outlining all the topics I would cover with my students. However, when I arrived at the conference center, I promptly threw the entire plan into the trash. I was no longer interested in teaching other artists how to draw or paint, but rather to be more observant and fully invested in life. I'd always opened my workshops with the shock, rehearsed lecture, but today I was winging it without the crutch of my notes. I relayed to the class what I had discovered on my trip to the conference center, adding how I also received perhaps dozens of ideas for paintings. As I went around the room asking what the other artists noticed on their drive, on their drive there, I got the confirmation I was seeking. Most every artist in attendance was too preoccupied with the task of getting there to notice much of anything. They simply lacked the awareness of the world around them, just as I had lacked it until my attention was grabbed by those dancing trees and frolicking crows. Those few moments of my life served as an example of what most of us do for, most of our, for much of our lives. We look at everything with superficial glance, taking it for granted, because we are too busy. We are so busy searching for that one big thing that will change our life that we pass by the little things that change our life moment by moment. Sometimes the very thing we're looking for, our purpose, is staring us right in the face. And we miss it due to the lack of awareness. Becoming observant and refining this skill can create the awareness and completely change our life. We are all searching for meaning in life. What we don't realize, however, is that the key to discovering our purpose and fulfilling it is found in the little things, because that is where purpose lies. We can all find meaning and perspective in gorgeous sunsets, vast mountain ranges, in the birth of a child or a death of a loved one. But how often are we going to experience the birth of a child? And sunsets are wonderful, but how many could we consider life-changing? If you are waiting for these relatively isolated moments to find meaning, you may have a very long wait indeed. However, if you will just open your eyes, you will see that all around us is beauty. Recall the examples of the rain that ruined our plans and the ugly weed in our garden, in which you can find meaning. It's all a matter of perspective, and once we shift our mindset, these ordinary things will reveal themselves to be anything but. While we may not have the time to look at everything this way, we can train ourselves to be more consciously aware, allowing us to experience life through new, more observant eyes. The more we practice this, the easier it becomes until one day we find ourselves doing it out of habit consistently reminding ourselves how everything has its own significance and beauty and how we are connected with it. This is what opens us and makes us more aware as human beings. If 
We are to get the most out of our purpose, derive meaning, we must search for meaning in everything. Take nothing for granted and be grateful for it all, from the vast mountain range to the dewdrop on the single blade of grass. This is the fabric of life, the consciousness of the universe manifested in its creation of all that is, including us. We are all connected. That makes us pretty significant. Significance in the insignificant is a paradox as all life truly is. And that ends that chapter. See how it tied into the last one, right? So, super artist millennial, what you got to say about all that? I like his perspective because, yeah. for, for one, being somebody who's, who's creative and, and inspiration person, right? I could see where my experience, right? Because me and Mark are very, mm -hmm. very similar. <laughs> but he's had much more experience than I have. How listening to people that mm -hmm. are very similar, I'm filling in so many gaps of things that I never thought about in the same way. For me, um, he had a post somewhere in the, the community that said the same energy that a thought is created from is the same thing that life comes from. It's the same thing like the baby being born mm -hmm. and all this stuff the exact same energy so when you put things like that and you let like you said the normal things that you see go by that the amount of energy or creation or just uplifting that you miss on a daily basis is crazy yeah and that's you know so when we talk about that we talk in here when we're talking about the stages right and we're talking about how stress works and so stress is normal it's a normal response but when you're stressed out you are stuck in restriction and resistance aim. Your physiology is stuck. It's tight. Your focus is in fear. And your behavior is reactive. But in that reaction, you are in perceptual blindness. You can't see the crows playing in the air. You can't see it. You're worried. Your, your whole trip to, to the conference center is about getting there, making sure I got a good parking spot, wondering what time I'll get off. Do I have lunch? Do I? It's a problem. Right? Oh, I gotta get there. I gotta do this. I gotta I gotta impress a teacher. I gotta do something. And how many of you go to work? Well, nobody's going to work now, but how many of you wake up each day and you put yourself in that blind reaction? Blind reaction is just you allowing the ego to take conscious mind control. And how do you break that? By taking a moment. Just what he said. Start noticing your environment. Start listening to people. Really look at something. And when you do that, if you find yourself stressed out, remember, that's a sign that you're unconscious because it's not normal. So if you're stressed out, change your aim, which changes your focus, which changes your behavior and opens your mind. We talked this week on fixed versus growth mindsets and it opens your mind in fact i just finished writing a chapter in, in the book on that and I'm, I'm finishing up the illusion book and i was talking about i actually put the covid experience in there about when it happened and how we changed everything in 48 hours we took a plan that we've been working on a year and a half and changed it mm -hmm. and never missed a beat but that's only because we are restrictive does that make sense? And that's what he's saying in there. Because people know. Also, what ha happened to Mark, that's called an awakening. And there's different awakenings. An awakening is when you actually see. And they can be very immense. I had one of our, one of my clients ended up in a urgent care. And there was nothing wrong with her. That was an immense awakening. What happened? She released a big program and programs are held in the subconscious and the subconscious controls the body. That's what happened. But she hasn't been the same since. Mm -hmm. Now, little awakenings are the ones that Arashante talks about because these are the ones, everybody's waiting, like he said, you're waiting for this big thing to come, blow up and lights and you want to meditate and you want to have everything light up. And it can happen. But if that's what you're waiting for, here, we're waiting for a long time. And so you have to look at these little things. That is awareness. That is being mindful. The littlest things. You know, how walking down the stairs. 
I walk down the stairs of our house, I can feel my feet. I just take my time. I just relax down all the time. And it's like, it, he's right. It becomes a habit after a while, but it's really a state of consciousness. So what happened to Mark and what he's talking about, that's what we mean by awakening. He was awake. And when you have those awakenings, then it's, then, then it's never the same. <laughs> Sometimes it's very disturbing. As uh, Jesus said in, in the book of Thomas, it really could be disturbing. David. It's, it's definitely an experience. I would say that it, it, the perspective, everything just becomes so different. And like I said, I've done, you know, I've had small experiences, you know, from here and there, especially from dramatic, you know, things that happened to me. Um, and that's one of those things, like you said, do you want to wait for these one moment or take advantage of it all the time? Because trust me, you don't want to wait to a, a devastating life experience to happen every time for you to finally wake up <laughs> and then yeah i know people people have near-death experiences right and they come and it's like they have the most amazing experience and then a couple months later they just fall right back into the human constraint the human constraint is that trap of that socialized mind and, it, and it's everybody does it everybody does it it's 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 survival it's normal but the idea is practice this is what mark's saying practice i don't have a my closing somewhere over here. Ah, I see. Got it. It's been an interesting <laughs> episode, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is the greatest shift of the planet. You can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. Please, I ask you guys, if you can give us uh, just a quick shout out in there, if you can go in and review it, because I know in the app and uh, in iTunes, the the Apple, you can just click it and give us a quick shout out and say, wow, love that super millennial. Yeah, Leandro, thank you. I know he went in. Yes, and he did thank you us. very much. We do. You don't understand how we appreciate that because that's how we get out there, right? Mm -hmm. As always, until next time, stay, stay inspired. inspired.